Some of you know that when I was a boy, now I say that to make you think it's not true today. When I was a boy, I loved wrestling. Did you notice how I said it? Not wrestling. I loved wrestling. I'm talking about the fake stuff. I'm talking about Hulk Hogan, brother. But there was one particular wrestler. They called him Jimmy Super, Super, Super Fly. Jimmy Snooker. Now, if there are any closet wrestling fans in the congregation this morning, you know who Jimmy Snooker was. He was a high styling, profiling, from the top ropes, leaping professional wrestler. And I can remember Jimmy's catchphrase. Super, super, super fly. And friend, whether you realize it or not, that's what you need this morning. Not to be super fly, but to be fructa, fructa, fructified by the Spirit of God. As you leave this place, chanting to your children, fructa, fructa, fructify. As your family in the car pulls into the driveway, fructa, fructa, fructify. It might be good for you to know what that means. To fructify, it's actually a word. It means to make something fruitful. To fructify is to take something and to cause it to be productive. In Genesis chapter 1, we find that this is the mission of God's Spirit. For, friend, never forget, we're Trinitarians. That means we believe that the Godhead exists as Father, Son, and Spirit. And whenever God works, it's always a Trinitarian work. In Genesis 1, God creates... But it's not a singular God denying the Trinity. It's the Trinitarian God who creates. The Father creates through the Son, John 1, by the Spirit, Genesis 1, 2. And each person of the Trinity has a distinct or economic role in the mission of God. The Father plans. The Son executes. The Spirit fructifies. Genesis 1 2. The earth is without form and void. Darkness is on the face of the deep. You must read your Bible well. God doesn't go from nothing to something beautiful. The initial act of creation is the creation of something that we would describe as being blah. It's a blank canvas. It's a watery chaos. And God, over what some call the primordial chaos, God, through His hovering spirit, speaks. The Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. And in Genesis 1-3, God said, and most of you understand that God, through ten speech acts, God speaks 
and the world comes into existence. But oftentimes, because we poorly read the scriptures, we miss the work of the Spirit. For instance, in Genesis 1, 11, God says, and as we listen to what he says, who's he talking to? There are many who would say, Mother Nature, there's no such thing as Mother Nature. But he's speaking to the inanimate creation. That doesn't make sense to tell the inanimate creation to do something when it has no ears to hear. Who is the Father through the Son speaking to? And I believe the best reading is to understand that He's speaking to the Spirit and He's calling upon the Spirit to work. Listen to what He says. Let the earth bring forth grass. What's He calling for? Fructification. The herb that yields seed. The fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself, and it was so. The hovering spirit moves upon the creation, and he fructifies. In Genesis 2, we get to the climax of God's creation. God has formed man from the dust of the ground, but the man has no life. I want you to consider with a fresh set of eyes, how is it that the inanimate man is brought to life? God forms him out of the dust of the ground, but then notice this, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath or the spirit of life, you could translate this, this way, the life-giving spirit, the life-animating spirit is spoken or breathed into the inanimate man. And what happens next? Boom! Man fructifies. He becomes a living being. Genesis 1.31 states that when the finished work of the Spirit reaches its telos, God behold everything that he had made, and it was very good. The Spirit, it should say fructifier of God's creative work. Now, if you can, hold your place in Acts chapter 2, and I'd like for you to turn quickly to Genesis 8. You see, sometimes it's because we don't know our Bibles well, and we're not well acquainted with the themes that are cultivated in the Old Testament, that we cut ourselves short when it comes to our New Testament reading. We should never depart or unhinge from the Old Testament. It's the means by which we understand the New Testament. Look at Genesis chapter 8. Notice some of the words. In Genesis 8, God has destroyed the world in a flood. Now you've got to picture it as you read. The world has again returned to primordial chaos. Waters cover the highest mountain by 15 cubits. Humanity and animal life sits floating in an ark. This is tohu vabohu, the Hebrew words for void, dark. It's Genesis 1-2 all over again. And notice what God does. God remembers Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind. Now this is where translation is treason. Because in the Hebrew language, there is one word that is translated wind. 
breath, lowercase spirit, and capital S spirit. It's a word, ruach. And it's up to the translator how to render it best into English. And God makes a wind. Now picture this. Hover over the waters. Where did you see that first? Genesis 1, 2. What is being signaled here? It's not creation. It's another theme. Re-creation. Preacher, how, how do I know that you're just not twisting that? Well, the text further sustains this idea. In Genesis 1, as the Spirit begins the work of creation, the Spirit separates the waters above from the waters below, creating an expanse. This is followed by the appearance of dry land and vegetation. And similarly, notice Genesis 8, verse 2. As the Spirit begins to move, we find the recreation of the expanse. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained. At the beginning of verse 3, and the waters returned. Well, in the Genesis 1 account, okay, God created the expanse. And then after God created the expanse, he caused the dry land to appear and the vegetation. Well, here's what's striking. When you read Genesis 8, first the spirit moves. Then the heavens shut and the expanse is solidified. And then the next thing that we're told here in Genesis 8 in verse 5. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And the 10th month on the first day of the month, the top of the mountains were seen the dry land reappears. Genesis 8 is being shaped by Genesis 1. It's a work of recreation. Now, the next thing we would expect is for vegetation to appear and for fish and fowl to be created. But remember, the fish weren't destroyed in the flood. It's interesting that the text mentions next what animals brought out by Noah. Birds. And they're sent out to find what? Vegetation. And the dove comes back with an olive branch in its beak. Well, how did God culminate his first act of creation? He capped it off by making the land, animals, and man. And in Genesis 8, who are the last groups to get off the ark? The land animals and man. And God is proclaiming to us in the very opening book of Scripture something about the Spirit. This forgotten God. The Spirit. He's the one who brings creation to its telos. He's the one that brings recreation to its end. The Spirit is the fructifier. Of God's creation. Of God's recreation. Now if this is true, what were to happen if God were to remove his spirit? You just think logically. If God were to remove his spirit, if it's the spirit of God which sustains the creation, if it's the spirit of God which brings productivity and fruitfulness to the creation. What would it happen if God were to remove his spirit and the spirit's work from the earth? What would happen? It makes sense to logically hypothesize that everything would die. Listen to what Job says. He's talking about God. 
If he should set his heart on it, if God wanted to, and if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, here's the consequences. If God calls back with a whistle, spirit, retreat, and the spirit retreated from the earth, here's what would happen. All flesh would, say it with me, perish. And man would return to dust. Boy, this reinforces the reading of Genesis 2-7 as God breathing the animating spirit into man, causing him to come to life. The presence of the Spirit fructifies. The absence of the Spirit kills, destroys. I'd like for you to go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 36. Love to hear those pages turn. Ezekiel chapter 36. Because of time, I don't have the ability this morning to demonstrate that God does a work of creation coming out of Genesis 11. The creative work is the building of a people. Through Abram, God seeks to build a people. Coming out of the dispersion of the nations, Genesis 11, God, through Abram, seeks to build. It's a new creative work, and it's done by the Spirit. Israel's birth is credited to the Spirit. But most of you are familiar with Israel's history. God's Spirit will not always strive with man. And because of Israel's unfaithfulness, God did something to Israel. He removed the blessing of the Spirit. And Israel as a nation was destroyed. Exile. You are reading the prophet Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel lived during the exile. But God did not completely abandon his people while he had done a work of chastisement. God coming to Ezekiel the prophet, coming to him during the exile, God spoke through Ezekiel a promise of recreation. I want you to listen carefully as I read through this promise. Pick up. In verse 6 of chapter 36, Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations, referring to their destruction, exile, captivity. Therefore says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath, that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. But you, O oh mountains of Israel, you will shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. And by inflammation, he's going to call them home. For indeed, I am for you, Israel. I will turn you, Israel, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. And the cities will be inhabited again, and the ruins rebuilt. And I will multiply upon you men and beasts, and they shall increase and bear young. And I will make you inhabited as in the former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings. And you will know that I am Yahweh. Now jump down to verse 22. How will God accomplish this? Hint, hint, the Spirit. God will use His Spirit. Now, as I read this, I want some of you to think of Jesus and His conversation with Nicodemus. How was it that a person would see the kingdom of God? They had to be born of water and of the Spirit, right? Born of water, born of the Spirit. That's best understood to be a fulfillment of this prophecy. 
Look for water and spirit in the text I'm about to read. Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, this work of recreation. It's not about you, Israel. But for my holy name's sake, God is for God. Which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. God's salvation is always by grace. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Makes you think of the disciples' prayer. Hallowed be your name. That's a prayer for this work to be completed. Verse 24, I will take you from among the nations. I will gather you out of all countries and I will bring you into your own land. And then notice what happens. Born of water, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. What are they going to be cleansed from? The filthiness that led to the exile. Their idolatry. They must be washed and they will be. But remember what Jesus said? It's not just being born of water, born of the spirit. Look at verse 26. I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh. And give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my judgments and do them. What causes the epical shift? What takes the barren nation to being a fruitful nation. Fructa, fructa, fructify. The Spirit of God coming and dwelling in the heart of man changes everything. Now watch. Then you will dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. Then you'll be my people. I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. Bring no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and increase your fields so that you never need again to be the, bear the reproach of famine amongst the nations. The Spirit's outpouring doesn't just affect the heart. It actually transforms the creation. Now, look at chapter 37. Do you know that often when God would give a prophet a message, he would give the prophet an illustration or a vision? So everyone here knows what God's promised. Right? The spirit that recreated Noah's world is going to recreate a nation. But Ezekiel, living in exile, needs to see something so the message gets through his thick skull. So look at chapter 37. The word of the Lord came. Brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. Can you picture it? And the Spirit caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. It's a valley full of dead men's bones, and they're very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, I don't know. Only you know God. Look at verse 4. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, Hear the words of Yahweh. Thus says the Lord God of these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you will live. I will put sinews upon you, and bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you will live. Then you will know I am Yahweh. The knowing comes after the Spirit's transformative work. So 
I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came together, and the skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the, to the breast, prophesy, son of man, say to the breast, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of bone, man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say right now our bones are dry, our hope is lost, we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says Yahweh your God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of the graves and bring you into the land of Israel and you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your eyes. Verse 14, I will put my spirit in you and cause you to live. And I will place you in your own land, and you will know it. That I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Watch this. Hear me carefully. The prophets spoke of a future day when God's Spirit would be sent to fructify God's people. Are you with me? Now go with me to Gospel of Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Because we lack time, the prophets not only foretold that the Lord would send this outpouring of His Spirit, the prophets also foretold that the Lord would raise up an anointed Spirit bearer. And here's how Israel would know that the day of the promised restoration was beginning. They would know when the spirit anointed one arrived. Because the one anointed with the spirit was not only coming to do a work of salvation, he was coming to do a work of restoration to the people of God. The one upon whom the Spirit would fall would have the power and capacity to baptize others with the Spirit. Luke chapter 3 notes this critically important event. When all the people were baptized, baptized by John the Baptist, that baptism was a baptism of repentance, recognizing that they had sinned, they're washing themselves with water and anticipating the spirit birth brought by the anointed Messiah. And it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. Sometime read the prophet Isaiah. He cries out, open the heavens and come down. Speaking to God. God opens the heavens. Amen. And God the Spirit comes down. Resting upon the Son. Let's read this. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. What's the whole significance of the dove? The dove brought back the fruit of the Spirit's work in Genesis 8. The Holy Spirit, manifesting Himself in the form or shape of a dove, descends from the sky that's been rent and rests upon Jesus. In Genesis 1, where did the Spirit hover? Over the waters. In Genesis 8, where did the Spirit hover? Over the waters. In Luke 3, where is the Spirit now hovering? Over the waters of the Jordan, the very place where the nation of Israel was born. And what is God saying from heaven? The prophecy of Ezekiel is beginning to be fulfilled. The Spirit's hovering, signaling what? There's a work of unanticipated, unparalleled 
recreation that's about to be launched by this one. My son. The work that Adam failed to do, Jesus, the Son, will accomplish. Amen. Now here's what's, here's what's mind-blowingly interesting. Luke does something no other gospel author does. He interjects the genealogy, boom, right after the baptism. Why? Look at the end of the genealogy. He's the only one that does it. Verse 38. He's leading you somewhere. Luke wants you to see something. Jesus was the son of Adam. Which was the son of God. This comes after a voice from heaven says, You are my beloved son whom I am well pleased. And then right after this he goes into the wilderness to defeat the serpent. What's happening? It's the beginning of the restoration. Go to the end of Luke. Flip to the end. Come on. Hang with me. Go to the end of Luke. Verse 49. Right before he ascends, the risen Son of God, the last Adam, stands over his disciples. And he says, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. What promise? It's the promise of restoration. It's the promise of the spirit. But, but tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with the power from on high. The power of what? The spirit. When did Jesus begin his earthly ministry? After the baptism. After the Spirit fell upon him, filled with the Holy Ghost, he entered into his ministry. And so the church, the disciples of Jesus, are now waiting in Jerusalem. Why are they inactive? The same reason Jesus was inactive for his first 30 years, waiting for the Spirit. You see, Spirit-empowered living is the model for all Christians. Spirit empowerment marks the covenant community. If our church should be known for anything, it shouldn't be known for anything less than being full of the Spirit. Right now in your life, any deep need that you have, I promise you, can be reiterated as a need for God's Spirit. Is your marriage struggling? It just needs to be fructified. Are you, are you feeling unfulfilled at work? You need a dose of fructification. Are you lost in despair? You need to be fructified. You need God to come along to your dry bones, cause you to live and bear fruit. Yeah. What type of fruit are we talking about? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, gentleness, Peace, patience, goodness, faith, everything you really need right now, you need the Spirit. The absence of life that you're experiencing right now, it's not because of your circumstances, it's because of a deficiency in spirit fullness. We go to Acts chapter 2. And let's briefly look at verses 1 through 4. 
when the day of Pentecost had fully come. They're all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Do you see what's happening again? The sky is being rent. Remember the prophet Isaiah. Oh, open the heavens and come down. And it happened once at the baptism of Jesus. And it's happening now at the baptism of the church. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire. And it's sitting upon each one of them. What's the deal with the fire? I thought it was a dove. Remember what John the Baptist prophesied of Jesus? There's one coming after me. I'm not worthy to unlatch his sandal. He will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. Who's doing this work in Acts chapter 2? Who's pouring out the Spirit? If you read the book of Acts and see it as anything less than the continued work of Jesus, you're, you're reading it poorly. Jesus has received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, and Jesus is now pouring out His Spirit to His disciples. And it's come. Now, now do you see it? The Spirit, as He comes, He hovers. What does He hover over? He hovers over His recreative work. What's he now doing? He's recreating a people. And notice what these people do. They're filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 4. And they begin to speak. A mark of spirit fullness is always God-directed speech. Think for a moment of Ephesians. Don't be drunk with wine or as excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. Wherever the Spirit rests, there will be voice. Voices of praise, adoration, supplication, proclamation, intercession. The Spirit is moving. Now notice verse 5. Why do you think Luke records this? There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of where? Every nation under heaven. What did Ezekiel prophesy? That the people would be brought back from where? All the nations. And the spirit would be poured out. They would no longer worship idols. They would now see Yahweh for who he is. And they would have a heart to obey him. And they would love and serve him. And it's starting to happen here. Notice all the nations from which they're gathered. I don't have time to demonstrate this, but this is specifically linked with Genesis 11 and the dispersion from Babel. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, strangers from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And anyone who's read their Bible well says, yes! It's starting to happen. The son of Adam has brought upon us the last days. Not yet in fullness, but the beginning, the inauguration. It's here. Marked by the spirit who fructifies the people. Well, does the Spirit fructify? Look at verse 37. This was our text. When they heard this, they were pricked to the heart. Who's doing that? The Spirit, when He has come, He will convict the world of sin. Who's doing this? The Spirit. When they were pricked to the heart. And they said, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus. What does baptism symbolize? Yes, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. A hundredfold yes. 
What's it also symbolize? The prophetic washing of water that God promised as he removed stony hearts and gave people hearts of flesh to love him and serve him. That's what it symbolizes because the baptism is followed by the gift of the Spirit. You must be born of water and spirit. You must have your heart cleansed from idolatry and you must be given a new heart. That's the significance. Now watch. What happens to this community? What happens to this community? If I were to have just started the message here, I could have preached a message that went like this. Folks, the end of Acts chapter 2, it's the type of church we need to be. And all of you would have been like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we need to attend to the apostles' teachings. Yes. We, we need to be in fellowship together. Yes. We, we need to participate in the ordinances, the breaking of bread. We need to have more prayer meetings. Yes, yes. We need to be radical in our generosity. No, no. <laughs> Unless you're benefiting. Yes, yes. And we could all get worked up into a frenzy. Let's be an Acts 2 church. You can only be an Acts 2 church if you have an Acts 2 filling. Right. Now I say this, whether or not you hunger for me to teach you has nothing to do with me. It has to degree, do to the degree right now that you're filled with God's Spirit. Whether or not you long to pray, whether or not you have a heart that's drawn to prayer meetings, right now it has nothing to do with you being shy, it has everything to do to the degree to which you're filled by God's Spirit. You're, you're, you're giving right now. You're giving. Directly linked to the degree to which you're being empowered, directed, and controlled by God's Spirit. Your verbal witness, whether it exists or doesn't, has nothing to do with mediums, tracks, scheduled visitation. It has everything to do with whether or not you're filled with God's Spirit. You see, what we often do is stop at symptoms without diagnosing the root. What do we need now more than ever? We need a fresh outpouring of God's Spirit on the covenant community. We need to be fructa. Fructa, fructa, five. God wants to. Teenager, God wants to fructify you. In ways that video games can't. In ways that relationships can't. God wants to satisfy you. Men in ways that sex can't, in ways that substances can't. God wants to fructify you. What's your greatest need today? I say this unashamedly, whatever it is that you would respond with, if we dug deeper, what you need most is the work of God's Spirit. What I need most today, and if you're praying for me, would you pray this for me? God bless him with a fresh filling of your spirit. That's what we need. America doesn't need a new president. We need the Spirit. If fructification is what we need, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Rapid fire. We repent. I believe this. 
There are some people today, you're best described as dry bones. Everyone that loves you is checking for a spiritual pulse, and there's none. I don't say this in a mean and condemning fashion, but I say this to all the children or teenagers in this room. There are many of you that what you need most right now is fructification. You need the Spirit, and the Spirit will never come until you repent. You need the Spirit to do a work of repentance. Begin to cry out to Him, Spirit, grant me heart that would repent. Grant me a heart that I would see my sin as being wicked and that I would see you as being beautiful. Begin to pray for repentance. But repentance is not just for the unbeliever. Repentance is what we need. For too often we have grieved the Spirit. Too often we have quenched the Spirit. There's been too many days where we've lived in denial that our bodies are actually temples of the Holy Spirit. And even though, positionally speaking, as many as are led by the Spirit are the children of God, even though you are Spirit indwelt, you can go months without tuning in and praying to the Spirit, what would you have me to do today? It could be that you're trying to live apart from the power of the Spirit, and Jesus never for a moment tried to live in his flesh, so why should you? I really believe this. Every single one of us needs to repent for a lack of looking to God's Spirit. And then we need to ask. You know, Spirit filling is not permanent. All throughout the book of Acts, we find the church is leaky. This very church that gets filled in Acts chapter 4 needs to be refilled. We need to take Jesus up on the promise. If we who are evil could give good, give good gifts to our children, how much more would the Father in heaven give the Spirit to them that would ask? I challenge you this next week. Would you start every day, Lord, I need you to fructify, fructi fructify me. I need today your Spirit to give me life. You have not because you ask not. Beyond asking... We need to feed the Spirit. What does the Spirit love? His Spirit-breathed words. Because the mission of the Spirit is to take the Word of God and bring it to life. You must feed the Spirit. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly this week. As you do that, you will be increasingly filled. We need to look to the Spirit. The Spirit is not a force. You and I are not Jedis. Sorry to disappoint. The Spirit is a person of the Godhead who lives inside of you. And you need to tune in. You need to look to for some of us, that's going to mean shutting off the radio. Because when the Spirit speaks, He speaks in a still, small voice. How much of an opportunity does the Spirit have to speak to you? So many people today are characterized by constant noise. TV's always on. Radio's always on. We should listen. We should listen to how the Spirit will use God's Word in our heart to direct us, to fructify us. These are the things that we need to be committed to, our greatest need is the Spirit. And He's only found because of Jesus. I close with this. Acts chapter 4. Verse 24.
When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. And read now the end of verse 31. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. May the spirit fructa, fructa, fructify us. Let's bow for prayer. Father, to those who are struggling with sin, they need the power of your spirit. To those whose hearts are flooded by worry, they need the peace of your spirit. To those who are facing hard and difficult choices, they need the wisdom of your spirit. To those who are just struggling with forgiveness and bitterness and anger, they need the love. They need the patience of the spirit. To those who right now are characterized by hopelessness, they feel so defeated and downcast. Lord, right now they need the faith that only the Spirit can produce. Father, on behalf of our entire church family, I ask you to forgive us. Forgive us for on one hand exalting Jesus, and yet on the other hand overlooking your Spirit. Father, forgive us for seeking to go in the power of many things, caffeine, breakfast, a motivational speech, and yet not recognizing a superior power that flows from your spirit. God, forgive us for evangelizing without first praying for your spirit to work. God, forgive us for in our church activity, doing things without first listening to your spirit's voice. Lord, we know that the full restoration hasn't happened yet. It awaits your return. But this entire age that we live in is the age of the spirit. And Father, we join with David who pleaded, do not take your Holy Spirit from us. And what I mean by that, Father, is this. Allow this to be a place, an unusual place, where as folks come, the Spirit falls fresh upon us. Each week, anointing the singing, anointing the prayers, anointing the preaching, and most importantly, anointing the people so that when we go back into our homes, our neighborhoods, we go back as Spirit-anointed disciples. For if the Spirit is indeed filling us, that will take care of our witness. That, that will control our generosity. That will grant us sufficient wisdom to make difficult choices. So by faith, we join together in this closing prayer. And we ask for a fresh filling of your spirit in our temple, our church body. And may the spirit now even be manifested freshly in the way in which we sing this last song, a song that points us to the climactic arrival of our King, feasting in the house of Zion. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.